Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Week That Really Was for the week ending the 19th of January. My name is John McGurk. I'm the editor of Grip Media. I am joined, as I always am, by Sarah Ryan. Sarah, how are you? How is your week? I'm good. I'm good. Week's gone good. Um, I'm enjoying the cold weather, John. I love it. It's phenomenal. It's actually the best January I've had in, in, <laughs> in, in years. No, because like normally... Uh, the one thing I do apart from from working every day is I have to because Orla's at work so I've got to walk the dog and when it's raining and it's wet and it's miserable uh, as it often is in January that's just a horrible job Um, but it's been just it's been like fantastic weather this week I think I know somebody's already shouting at this show going no it's not you haven't been driving yet or you haven't been doing something but for me I really enjoyed it Um, it's just it's just you know I think crisp. really cold weather when it's sunny is the peak weather. Yeah, you know? and when you can go into a warm house as well, that's always well, that's that always always cozy and all those yeah. sorts of things. Anyway, people don't listen to hear us talk as we, about as we were told. They don't li- they don't listen to hear about our lives. So yeah, even though I mean, if they only knew the half of it, honestly. Um, <laughs> But they don't. Uh, they don't. They don't listen to us talking about the weather and our personal lives. They want to hear us talk about what happened this week, Sarah. So what caught your eye? Well, loads of things. But off the top of my head, I want to talk about Liv Hewson. Um, so not to be confused with Eve Hewson, who is Bono's daughter. Liv Hewson is an Australian actor, actress. Um, I think you call them all actors now. I think it's sexist to refer to anyone as an actress. Um, I'm just like really, really early in my life. Like I really thought I was going to end up being one of those old ladies who didn't care anymore what people said or thought. And I'm 40 and I'm already nearly there now. You know, like yeah. I just don't care. Yeah, whatever. Anyway, uh, Liv Hewson is an actor um, from uh, a few series people might say. Santa Clarita Diet, Yellow Jacket, stuff like that on Netflix, a few films as well. And um Houston is non-binary, um, gay, uses they, them pronouns and um, is quite famous within the kind of LGBTQ scene. Um, and Sorry, can we, 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 I need to, it's a terrible state of reflection on the state of the modern discourse, but I have to ask, when you say non-binary, gay, uses they, them pronouns uh, and, and you refer to her as, uh, it, this person was born a woman and is a lesbian, is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. But um, basically, Houston was in Team Vogue this week and um, at a couple of award ceremonies. And at one of the award ceremonies, is wearing a black kind of a blazer that's completely open and showing her double mastectomy scars. And then is also in an article on Teen, teen Vogue um, doing the same. And I suppose, like, I mean, first of all, it's just a kind of a, it's a form of mutilation. It's, you know, horrible to, for people to feel like they need to do that to their bodies or whatever. But I suppose what I'm more kind of concerned about is the is the celebration of it in Teen Vogue, um, which is obviously aimed at, you know, teenage girls. And just the kind of, the the, the, the whole narrative around it as being, you know, brave and amazing. And I think it's a real scary, worrying thing. I mean, like, obviously it goes without saying, you know, people can do whatever they want with their own bodies and everything. But I think a young, I mean, she must be um, born in 1995. So very young um, person, um, like in her 20s, you know, changing her body forever like that is is scary to me not necessarily something to be celebrated not something to be promoting without proper context to teenagers in a magazine and you know there's demonst- there's been de- demonstrable evidence in the past that things like this you know have a kind of a contagion effect and I, I just I don't know I just think there's something troubling to me and I'm not articulating it very well about the fact it's sort of celebrated as some kind of amazing show of, of you know, bravery and amazing show of some, some kind of freedom. And I think, you know, I'm old enough to remember, as they say, that mutilation of women's bodies wasn't a good thing about an hour ago. 
Well, look, there's a couple of things I'd say here, sir. First of all, uh, Teen Vogue isn't a isn't a phrase I've heard in a couple of years. But a few years ago, I remember um, that magazine was was basically the bane of the culture. I, I, I kind of thought it had gone out of fashion, but it, it was it is as you say, it's targeted at kids and people might be listening to this who've never heard of it might wonder why Sarah and I are talking about it because they haven't heard about it either. Um, but it's not targeted at you. Um, if you're sitting there in your, in your 30s or your 40s and you're an Irish bloke or an Irish woman, you've never heard of Teen Vogue, well, you know, they, they, they don't market at you. This is marketed at exactly who it sounds like it's marketed at. It's marketed at kids. And they had, they've had they had all sorts of like appalling things in that magazine from kind of like, I remember a couple of years ago they did a guide to anal sex for teenage girls and not teenage girls who are 17 18 teenage girls who are 12 13 14 um that's the first thing um so yeah i i know exactly what you're saying but you did say something that i want to challenge you on a little bit where you said you said people have a right to do what they want with their own bodies and i'd say yes within reason but i mean th- there is a known condition it's thankfully amazingly rare but it's been documented um where people have a psychological attachment to the idea of getting rid of one of their limbs cutting yeah. off a leg or becoming or I remember a horrible case where there was was one guy who fantasized about having a spinal cord cut because he didn't feel like he was himself while he could still feel his legs. And yeah. and I don't think people have a right to do that. I think if you are somebody who wants to have your spinal cord cut or have your leg cut off, then you have a medical condition and you're not thinking responsi- responsibly. And I would wonder whether I mean obviously it goes without saying there are legitimate medical conditions, sadly, that many, many women will face that will necessitate a hysterectomy or necessitate a mastectomy. Um, but if you're a perfectly healthy young woman, and I mean, this person, from what you're saying, is is non-binary. They're not now saying they're a male person. They just wanted to have their breasts cut off. I mean, that to me is not something you should be allowed to do. I'm sorry if that makes me sound like an authoritarian, but I, I think that indicates that you've got kind of mental trauma and aren't mental trauma and aren't thinking straight. Well, and I suppose that, it's not even it's not even about whether or not you should be allowed to do it. It's the, it's whether or not you would be able to find a doctor willing to do it. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? I mean that's where you should come upon a problem with this. In that, who is the doctor who is agreeing? to perform an unnecessary double mastectomy on a girl in her 20s. What is, where is the ethical, do you know what I mean? Because by that rationale, to your point, if I present, I mean, we, we you know, people who have body dysmorphia, who have anorexia, which I, I, I apparently at one point um, I've read today, um, Liv Houston also suffered from anorexia for a long period. If an anorexic person goes to a doctor and says, I'm fat, when I look in the mirror, I see fat, do they validate that as well? Do you know what I mean? Like, how do, where is the doctor who's saying, yeah, no, do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to perform a double mastectomy on this healthy female because that seems like something she wants, you know, like. Yeah, I mean, look, I think there needs to be a basic rationality test. Because obviously people have within reason the right to do what they, they want with their own bodies. I mean, I, I don't have any objection to people going and staying on the topic of breasts, maybe getting a breast enhance, enhancement, or which is also very common, somebody who wants to have a breast reduction for cosmetic reasons or because their back is sore or whatever. Um, there's there's a difference there between somebody who, who says, I want my arm, fingers, legs, toes, boobs, whatever it is, removed entirely. There's a, but it's, there's, also, there's a but it's also not because it's it's about extremes. And if you think about it, do you remember years ago there used to be that TV show Euro Trash that was like, and there was this woman on it called Lola Ferrari. I'll never forget it. And she had like I don't know how many surgeries on her like breast implants. They were so big. She ended up dying, as I recall. Ultimately. I don't know. You wouldn't have caught me watching something like Euro Trash now, Sarah. Sure. No, You're a conservative. But, I was um, glued to it. I was glued to it. I was about, it was on, it was, it was on Channel 5, I think. And I was everyone was. It was the most scandalous thing you'd ever seen at the time. Yeah. But the point is that she, she, um, sorry. Um, the point we had is. an interjection from one of Sarah's children there for the listeners. Sorry, I, I wouldn't just, worry about that. No, they're more than welcome. If they have any views, we'll, uh, we'll happily have them on the show. Well, not today. Um, the point is that Lola Ferrari ended up dying. Um, and 
it would be considered, you know, in hindsight, it's absolutely scandalous that any doctor continue to perform more and more and more breast enhancement surgery on her when she clearly had a mental disorder that was, you know, giving her some kind of body dysmorphia or some problem. Like it wasn't normal to want to have breasts this big. And it's in the same department. It, it is. I mean, I, I, you know, and in any other field we'd recognize it. If I was to go into my GP tomorrow and say, doctor, I want to be blind and I want you to take my eyes out. I yeah. would be sent to a mental asylum. I hope. I hope I'd be sent to a mental asylum for my own protection. But we um, also heard, you know, a lot about. Do you remember the woman who ident who um, claimed to be black, Rachel um, Dolezal? Dolezal. Like, why can you identify as a different gender or no gender, but you can't identify as a different race? I mean, it's you know, why is one more logical than the other? Uh, I don't know, but I I just think that ethically, I've I have huge concerns ultimately about a healthy 25 year old woman having a double mastectomy and not just that and not just that being done but it being be kind of celebrated as some kind of you know empowerment that, that is i think the bigger problem i think the bigger problem is not the 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 people in the population who want to do these things and the minority of doctors who are happy to profit from doing them for them the problem is the extent to which it is is being normalized not even among uh, two kids but amongst adults in such a way that people can't feel feel that they can't be the person who stands up and says this is nuts and this this woman has difficulties and a problem that that, that don't feel able to say to their own kids okay look this person uh live Houston is the name you mentioned um clearly has you you don't want to end up like her basically instead it has to be validated all the time so it has to be applauded it has to be oh it's so brave it's so courageous and to come out and talk about this Actually, no. It's 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 a little bit like, and I, I think I've written this before. It's a, it reminds me a little bit of in you know early Victorian England when you know they didn't have hospitals uh, for the mentally unwell, so they decided to fund one by letting people come in at the weekend and pay a shilling to go and, and look at all the lunatics in the asylum. That's where the word bedlam comes from. That was the name of the hospital. People could go in and they could peek in through the the walls of the people banging their head off the walls. And that's what a lot of modern society feels like to me, that it's a kind of a, 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 an organized freak show. Sorry if that's harsh, but that's, uh, and I think that's the sense I get from stuff like this. But you're, but, but at the same time, you're not allowed to say anything hmm. about any of it. You know what I mean? Like you're not allowed, to, you're, you know, you're not supposed to say, I mean, my kids are still very young, so it doesn't apply, but you're still, you're not allowed to say, if I come in and my daughter is reading Teen Vogue that I'm not allowed to say, and I want to say I'm not allowed. I will be, but you know what I mean. I'm not allowed to say. Supposedly not allowed to say. But in my opinion, this is a real tragedy. This isn't something. To, you know what I mean to be celebrated. Like any kind of mutilation of anybody's body that's not medically necessary to me is very sad. I'd also think it was pretty sad if she had a tattoo across her face. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like that, a girl like that or they, them, whatever, is not something that I think is 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 to be celebrated. And, and I have massive concerns that when, you know, five and 10 and 15 years from now, when, you know, th things have changed and, and as they as they are inclined to do, that there'll be regret there. Oh, 100% there'll be regret. And I think I think when it comes to, and, you know, it comes to the whole kind of, I mean, we're already seeing a wave of people coming forward having had sort of gender reassignment surgery, expressing regret and saying, you know, I was misled. And, and those numbers are only going to grow. They're only going to grow. And I think the point here is, lest Sarah and I sound like some kind of censorious, kind of like everyone should look the same people, we're not. There's a whole range of behaviors. This is the point, I think, the key point is, there's a range of human behaviors inside the sort of spectrum of sanity where we might have to tolerate things. I mean, some people don't like you know there are, I, I see people with whole sleeves of tattoos for example or people who've had most of their body covered with tattoos and you know it's not to my taste but you know more power to them they're not doing themselves any physical harm um th there there are all sorts of choices about obesity and uh, the aforementioned cosmetic surgery and so on yeah. if, if they make you feel fine you're not doing something that's fundamentally damaging or life-altering to your body um like so, if you have your your breasts removed as a woman, then that's a that's a permanent and irreversible decision, um, and you don't know how you're going to feel about it in fifteen twenty years. 
and uh, no doctor can tell you how you're going to feel about it in 15 or 20 years. Whereas a tattoo can be removed. Yeah. Uh, painfully, I'm told, but it can be removed. So anyway, yeah, I think you're I think you're right to notice that. I have to say that story had escaped me entirely because I was focused on the other great freak show of the week, which was what was going on in Davos. Yes. Um and uh, people always write in to Grit about, um, not people, some people write in regularly about the World Economic Forum. And they're, it, it's one of those things, you know, if you mention the World Economic Forum online, you'll get, you'll get a range of responses. But a lot of them will sort of, sort of blame the w, WEF for all that's going wrong in the world because they see it as this collection of the world's elites and the world's leaders coming together to sort of plot and scheme what's going to happen over the next year and yeah. they, they believe there's something nefarious about it and I'd say I'm not in that camp I don't think there's anything particularly nefarious I think there's a lot unhealthy about it we'll come to it in a second I don't, there's anything, I don't think they're kind of sitting around in secret meetings planning to take away people's rights but I do think it is an exercise in establishment and elite Groupthink, which is deeply harmful to those who participate in it, because it, it leaves them coming away believing um, that they themselves are kind of great players on the world stage, conferring with other great players on the world stage, and that they are part of some kind of enlightened elite. And I'm, I'm sorry to break it to Leo Bradker, but he's not part of an enlightened elite. He's mm-hmm. a he's a he's a bog standard doctor who happened to win an election. Um, and and I think it's harmful in that way, in the sort of in the way it, it sort of brings out the worst sense of self of the people in power around the world. But every now and again, you get somebody who goes along there and kind of shakes it up a bit. And the new president of Argentina, I think you were very impressed by him this week, Sarah. God, I loved this. I just loved it. Like I loved everything about it. I so he stands up and he gives this speech, right? Mm. And he just he goes for it, John. He just goes for it. He first of all just like kind of just goes for socialism and like also kind of expands the parameters of what people would understand socialism to be. So, you know, it's not just uh it's not just you know the the kind of the economic socialism that people generally understand, but he just goes that says goes for it and says the West is in danger. Socialism it, it leads to poverty, um, free markets. If, if if a market isn't working, it's always because of gov- government intervention. Freedom is gone. He's a libertarian. Uh, Argentina is now a libertarian country. Uh, it was amazing. I mean, it was just you know, it's like I always say to you, I love hearing. The alternate view, and you, and 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 we don't really hear it that often. And you know, he's just won a, a presidential election, fifty something percent of the vote. Um, like he's he has his mandate, and he also has it, it is coming from a country that's been destroyed by some of these ide- ideological positions, and has had them for longer than some of the people who are running our countries have been alive. So, you know, it was just it was just amazing the audience expressions and their their kind of lackluster clapping at the end was just beautiful and it was it was long he he touched on loads of stuff radical feminism feminism and state isn't the solution the state is the problem i mean it was just you know i don't know it was amazing did you watch it I haven't actually had time to watch the whole thing yet. Um, I've seen a few clips of it, but I actually did see something of Javier Millet. Um, I think it was an interview he did with a couple of Argentinian podcasters mm. a week or two ago, and I saw a bit of it. And a couple of things strike me about this guy. Um, yeah. The first thing is, you know, for all that he gets compared to um, Donald Trump and Nigel Farage and like part of this kind of like new right taking over the world, he... he He's not, uh, that is intended to convey this kind of sense that the guy's a cowboy, you know, or that he's he's kind of sending tweets like Trump would send them or whatever. No, yeah. this guy is really, really smart. That's yeah. the first thing that strikes me about him. Like, he is somebody who is, like, when he was, when, he, when, when that election was happening here, and like a lot of people, I was aware that it was happening, and I was aware of it through mainstream media coverage. I didn't have time to go looking into the details of what happened in Argentina, so I was just taking in 
the sort of whispers you would hear on the wind through a kind of like a little piece in the Irish Times about how this outsider was doing surprisingly well in the election. And I kind of internalized what the media wanted me to internalize, which was this guy's a bit of a lunatic cowboy who's appealing to a desperate population and it's all going to be a disaster. And of course, it may all end up being a disaster. Success is guaranteed for nobody. But then once he won, and I started listening to the stuff he was saying, the only politician in my lifetime who I've heard speak the way he speaks about issues is, and this will sound terrible to some people, but uh, let me explain it, is Margaret Thatcher. Because if you ever listen to Margaret Thatcher speak, she was the one person who talked about ideology all the time, why she was against socialism, why she was against collectivism, why she, all these things. This guy does the same thing. And he is is clearly coming to office with a mission to do, uh, with a mission to sort of deregulate Argentina, uh, open open it up to global trade, all of those things. Um, and his his government vision, department, how many government departments did he shut down in his first week? Like it, literally his first week, he just yeah, like ha- have them, have them. Yeah. I mean, hook it to my veins, John. What's really interesting about him as well, though, is is that I mean, he is he's basically the anti Donald Trump in terms of his. And, 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 by the way, yeah. I get this every week. People say, "Oh, you're so anti Trump." I am not making a pro or anti Trump point here. I'm saying Millet is kind of the anti Trump in kind of the things he says. If you listen to Donald Trump, it's all like we we've got to we've got to get control of trade. We've got to pull in tariffs. We've got to deal with China. And all this sort of stuff. Whereas this guy, by contrast, is no. We've got to we've got to break down barriers to trade. We've got to reduce taxes on business. We we've got to open up to global markets. So so I mean, he's philosophically the complete opposite in but, many but respects. But he's but you're making the point, which is you know, it's a, it's a good example of that mainstream media is telling us it's not it's it's actually not based on ideological positions or you know the real fear of what you know Trump or whoever will do it's just the other he's the yes. other he's not he, it doesn't matter you know what i mean like i remember having this argument with somebody about trump before when he didn't get elected this, you know when he lost um and they're like oh it's a good thing cuz he would have started a war and i was like okay no that's not, that's nonsense. Like, he's the least interventionist president. Like, we can get into conversations about Trump, but this is just, you know, this is just garbage that, you, that, you're, that you've that you heard. You pick this up from some, you know, mainstream media, whatever, and it's not true. And it's 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 that melee Trump, that it doesn't matter that they're completely different ideological positions. It just matters that they're the other, and we will just throw any mud or anything and make them seem crazy or mental or bad or evil or a warmonger or whatever, whatever sticks, and everything will stick with some people. Do you know what I mean? And so this person was like, oh, tr- Trump is going to start a war. I was like, where? It, it reminds me of, I don't know if you if you remember this, but there was a period sort of after George W. Bush was president, from about 2000, from about the Iraq war on, and it lasted to about 2015, 2016, where everybody bad was a neocon. If you were kind of on the right at all, you were automatically a neocon. You were in line with those neocons. And I swear to God, I, I have to reckon, I got called a neocon all the time. I have to, and lots of other people did. I have to say, most of the people calling people neocons, I honestly believe, hadn't the foggiest notion what the term actually meant. It was just generic, the bad thing. It meant you were like uh, Bush and Blair. Uh, Blair, by the way, was not neocon. Um, but, and I think it's a very similar phenomenon here, where it's sort of like, you know, the, as you say, the other, the, the, the what, whatever is sort of in establishment, in opposition to the established liberal centrist order is mm. bad and is the same. And it's all the same. So Trump is bad. Millet is bad. They're both opposed to us. Therefore, they're the same. And that is kind of the attitude that pervades. You're you're correct about that, um, and you see it in Europe too. I mean, like the the comparisons, for example, between um, Marine Le Pen and Nigel Farage. Um, those two people couldn't be more different in their in their outlook on the world, but they're both sort of like they, they share a sort of skepticism of the European Union. Therefore, they're bad um, in the same way. And there's a lot of that that goes about. But anyway, enough talking about that. I, I, I really am very taken by this Millet guy. And I think it's going to be fascinating to see how he gets on because Argentina is a job of work. Yeah. This, this is the thing. Pete, nobody should be under any estimation this guy's going to come in and turn around Argentina. It has defaulted on its debt 
multiple times in the last 30, 40 years. It's been it was run by a dictatorship and then by a series of kind of quasi-dictatorships, mm-hmm. uh, as in elected leaders who ran the place like dictatorships. Um, it, it, it's, uh, it, it's a very corrupt place or has suffered from corruption. I shouldn't say it's a corrupt place like everyone in Argentina is corrupt. I don't mean that. But it's, it's a place that has been afflicted by corruption um, and is deeply in debt. So, I mean, he, he's... And, and the number one rule of politics, which, which everyone who's a political partisan pretends isn't true, is that the, almost nothing that can be accomplished without pain for somebody. Yes. Politics is ultimately about making decisions. And every time you make a decision, you're favoring one group over another. So, like, yeah. you, you know... He, he will struggle, but I'm fascinated to see how he gets on because I think he, he really is somebody who, for me, is is showing up his critics in terms of, and really, if you listen to the media about this guy and then you watch him, I think it's something everyone should do. They should think about what their first impression of him is and then watch and listen to one of his speeches and ask yourself why you had that impression when it was so wrong. But that's an interesting kind of segue into something else I wanted to talk about, which is uh, Jordan Peterson. Because I often have people, like I'm a fan of Jordan Peterson. I have read everything he's written. I really like him. I think there's things he's wrong about, but that's fine. Um, But with the exception of one person, um, and she sometimes listens to the podcast, so I won't, and I won't name her, but a friend of mine, I remember I said to her, I said, you're the first person I've ever met who has told me they don't like Jordan Peterson and actually read the stuff and been able to come up with a, 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 a coherent argument as to why you don't like Jordan Peterson. Because most people who go, oh, Jordan Peterson, whatever, a quick qu- couple of questions. And it's it's clear that they've taken the opinion they're supposed to have about this other and taken it from media and never actually read it. Mm. And they say, well, read the book read one of the books, watch whatever. And then like, where is this objectionable person, this woman hating kind of person? Where is this caricature caricature that's been created by the media? It doesn't exist. Does he have opinions about certain things that people don't like? Yeah, fine. But he's made out to be this kind of leader of the far right. And, you know, it's nonsense. It's absolute nonsense. He's just too lazy to actually read the book. So they just, you know, basically take their opinions from Twitter and, and people they like, uh, you know, tell, oh, what am I supposed to feel about this guy? Oh, we hate him. Oh, yeah, cool. Like, it's not real. And so the reason why I'm mentioning Jordan Peterson is because this week he's been in the news because um, the Ontario, he, he's had some complaints made about him or whatever. And the uh, uh, on Ontario College of Psychologists have been given the go-ahead to um enforce a, a punishment of sorts on him that he has to be re-educated um, which is like something from a dystopian novel but anyway um, that he has to go and, and be re-educated because his social media co- co- comments and some of the things he said on Joe Rogan's podcast have hurt, have hurt some people's feelings um, and I think that that is like I mean I laugh but it's just really not funny at all in the sense that that a uh, uh, person like that, a psychologist, can be threatened. You know, they've said that if he doesn't, if he doesn't agree to do this re-education, then they can they um, they can take pro- professional misconduct proceedings against him, which I imagine is a kind of a fitness to practice, practice ultimately a fitness to practice type review where he could lose his license. Um, I find that unbelievable and scary and just I mean fascinating that that's happening in the in a world where ultimately that they have the power to do something like that to somebody because ultimately what it boils down to is that they don't like him. It's funny you know I don't like Jordan Peterson. Why? Well for exactly the reasons you said I mean well, actually I have, to, I have a substantive reason and I have a general reason. Um, my substantive reason for not liking him is that I find that and you've talked about this on the show in the past um, I don't like, I don't like what I would describe as needless cruelty, and I think sometimes he's needlessly cruel. So, for example, I, I'd use the example of there's a there's a there's an American, sorry, I think she's Canadian. There's a Canadian model called Yumi Nu, um, and she's plus size model. She's a size twenty four, twenty six, or twenty eight. Or so I, I don't really know women's sizes, but I'm, I'm you know I, I know what a size ten is. So I'm you know, large yeah. lady. Yeah, yeah. And like he he's made a point when 
I think he singled her out to say that, that she wasn't attractive. Yeah, she was on the front of a magazine and he retweeted it and said, they were like, oh, so brave. And he retweeted, not brave, not attractive, not healthy, something, something. Yeah. 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 I, I, and I just think that's, I think that's needlessly cruel. I mean, first of all, first of all, I, I don't think any claim was made that the woman was attractive. I think she's just, and I'm sorry, I, I don't care if I sound woke on this, but no claim was made that the woman was attractive. She was just on the front of the magazine. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think I don't think there was, and I don't think a woman is in front of the magazine is automatically being sold to me as a man as a sex symbol. Um, and I think that's a bad way to think about it. Secondly, I, like Jordan Peterson, I don't find her attractive, but I, I you know I I don't feel the need to say that. I mean, there are a lot of women in the world I don't find attractive, and I, if, if I if, if you respond to pictures of them by saying not attractive, you just sound like a jackass. And I think he has a habit of doing stuff like that. That, yeah, that, I mean, you wouldn't walk up to a woman in a bar and say, I don't find you attractive, like, and expect not to kind no, of you, you have a drink thrown over you or whatever. Or that she was unhealthy or whatever. I mean, more power to her. She's living her best life and hopefully, hopefully, hopefully somebody does find her attractive. And if they don't, that's sad. But like, it's not my business to go up and tell somebody that they're unattractive on social media or in the real world. It's rude. And I remember Hannibal Lecter used to say that he only eats the rude. Which I yeah. always thought was his. That's the reason. The, that's what the the reason the audience likes Hannibal Lecter because he only eats bad guys. I'm not saying Jordan Peterson's a bad guy. I'm saying that's one reason I don't like him. And the other reason is this kind of business of crying all the time. You know, telling men to get in touch with their emotions and their, you know, their mask. I I find it all very tiresome. I, I will concede that anytime I've listened to him, he, he does say some really important things. Like I, I listened to a spiel he gave about the importance of, you know. I think it was something, I'm paraphrasing, but it was something along the lines of, you know, don't expect the world to give you anything if you can't tidy your room in the morning before you get up or make your own bed. Yeah. Like, there's really important stuff that he does say that makes his, makes his message worth listening to. But yes. I, I do think sometimes, I, I understand why a lot of people instinctively don't like him. If I heard, just if, if, put it this way, if I knew nothing about Jordan Peterson, other than that I heard he called some plus-sized woman uh fat and unattractive and health and unhealthy. My instinctive reaction would be this guy's a he's bad news. That'd be my instinctive reaction. And mm. there's a lot of people out there in the world who haven't heard anything more about Jordan Peterson other than that. Because he does these things. Yeah. Um, so I, I I understand and I think people have to be forgiven sometimes for for holding these views. That said, uh this business of him getting re education is sort of absolutely darkly hilarious. Um, but darkly hilarious because I mean th- there's no protect I mean first of all uh, does anyone think that he's going to change his opinions on the basis of sitting down with some of his colleagues going now Jordan no you have to think in culturally sensitive terms but you've said yourself on this podcast and it's a common thing we say you know the process is the punishment mm-hmm. and this is about you know spanking and humiliating him into this kind of you know, like back in your box because you've gotten a bit big for our liking. Yeah, but is he humiliated? This is the thing. And this is how I think the world is changing a little bit. And this is where I think progressives and liberals are losing control of the narratives. Is he humiliated or are they humiliated? Because when I hear that, and I, as I've said, not a Jordan Peterson fan at all, but when I hear that, I don't think badly of him. I think I, I think you guys are a joke. That's what I think. Maybe Maybe I'm in a minority. Maybe I still am in a minority. Maybe there's a lot of normies out there who will who will hear that and kind of go, "Oh, he must have done something wrong." So maybe that is a punishment. But I think for a growing number of people, it's it's laughable. Yeah, I mean, I think the people who hate Jordan Peterson anyway will love it, and then I think that the people who like him will think it's ridiculous, and then I think the people in the middle will think it's ridiculous if yeah. they actually look into it. Um, and the other thing is, it kind of comes back to all of this kind of <sighs> this sense that. Uh, a lot of progressives seem to have now who believe that their their opponents' opinions can be regulated out of existence. Yeah. Either by regulating misinformation or introducing hate speech bills or uh, re-educating Jordan Peterson or whatever it may be, that opinions we don't like can be regulated out of existence. And it's 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 kind of it's funny because it 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 so clearly won't work and can't work. Um you know, but but also it's it's kind of pathetic because it just shows that you don't really have that much confidence in your own opinions. Mm-hmm. Like I, I, I'm, you know, Fianna Fáil stock, and I'm married to a Fianna Gaylor, 
who is a libertarian who believes in the like the legalization of drugs, prostitution and anything else for all, you know, adults. And I disagree with him furiously on loads of those things. And we have great debates and conversations about things. And as in the 10 years or so that we've been together, I've convinced him on some things um, and he's convinced me on others. And, you know, we've met in the middle on other things, but like, don't you want your, don't you want the argy bargy of your, like of your, of your opinions? Don't you want to, to challenge your opinions, change your mind on a couple of things or whatever? Are you that afraid of the debate that you want to shut down everybody else? Is that, is that not a bit pathetic? Like I, 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 I fancy my chances in many of, in a, in a debate on many of the opinions I hold. To, to, you know they, these got snowflakes and and like pathetic kind of you know hurt, hurty words and and scaredy cats they have to shut down and make speech illegal because they're just so afraid of a real conversation it's one of the reasons is other first of all my marriage is the same as yours and that i'm married so I, I always joke that she was like a raving liberal when i met her but she wasn't a raving liberal but but all is a, a liberal yeah. person in the best sense of the word and we have fundamental disagreements on some issues and that is wonderful. And I, I often wonder how people who are married to people who agree with them all the time, like, do you not just get bored? Like, I, I presume they just never discuss anything that they, other than things that they might disagree on. Because how can you just talk about something you agree on all night? Even yeah. you and I on this podcast, we we agree on a lot, but we have different yeah. reasons for approaching that. And, and sometimes we disagree. Um yeah. But the other thing is, like, I, 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 I just think the most important thing you can do intellectually as a human being is to read, listen, and and talk to people who disagree with you. I have never missed, I think, for the last, oh, 15, 16 years plus, I've never missed one of Pinton O'Toole's columns in the Irish. Yeah. Re- no, I, I'm serious. I, I don't mean this as a, not as a joke. It's not as a not as a gag. Uh, I, I, I haven't yeah. missed one of his columns because I disagree with him fundamentally, but I swear at least once a month, Maybe that's too generous. Once every six weeks, he will make a point where I will go, I didn't think about it that way before. That is, even if I disagree with it, that is a strong and thought-provoking point. In fairness, yeah. Um, yeah. He's, he's also a wonderful writer for all his other, I, I shouldn't say for all his other flaws. He's a, he's, he's a good guy. I don't mean he has flaws, but he's wrong, I think, about almost everything. But he's, he, you know, he makes you think. I think yeah. that's really, really important. I always say to people, like, you, you, and I think that's one of the problems that progressives and liberals have increasingly is that they live in a ginormous echo chamber because if you're somebody who thinks like you and me sarah you yeah. cannot go through the week without hearing an opinion that you disagree with it's on the radio it's on rte news it's almost certainly in the television show that you're watching um, and yeah. it, it's 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 being present you know, the particular worldview being presented to you all the time and so we have to engage with it and we have to listen to we understand the arguments the other side are making because we live that we're, we're basically like a, a a fish that's in in water. You know, we, it, it's all around us. Um, and on the other side, um, you know, you can in Ireland, you you've got in terms of media, it's disagreed. You've got gripped media. We can be ignored. Um, you might have the odd guest on on maybe Kieran Cuddy's show on News Talk. You can switch that off and click over to Drive Time, where there'll be something much more palatable on. And I think it's it very often progressives don't hear opinions that challenge them. Not, not all. Obviously, some of them do, and some of them will seek them out to get angry. Um, but I think I think that's one big problem that progressives have is that they... And I find this when I debate them on the radio and television is that oftentimes I have an advantage because I know what they're going to say and they have no idea what I'm going to say because they don't immerse themselves yeah. in their opinions. Yeah. Um, so, well... And, and 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 you know it's easy because everybody they live in an echo chamber where everybody agrees with them and people like you are just bad and you know far right and whatever the you know current yeah and is. I, I I found down the years they expect you to be stupid as well because they, they've internalized this idea that uh, they're the smart people and so they'll turn up smugly and recite a point that that I might have heard seventy times before but they'll have never heard the answer to and then like they'll sit there kind of with their mouth open kind of saying how dare you. Because uh, they've never heard it before, so th- there is that. It's um, very important, I think, to 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 read people who you disagree with. It's however, fun. to be fair, we must note, we must, I must note that while there is lots of people that I think fall into that category, I've been um, pleased and amused 
by the people who fundamentally disagree with us, who have exposed themselves as having listened avidly to this podcast. You know who you are. Um, <laughs> so at least they're listening to this. So, you know, you say they don't they live in an echo chamber, but a lot of them listen to this podcast. Yeah, it's funny. I, and I, I always joke that uh, that there's there's one particular lady up in Sligo, she's a candidate for the Labour Party, who is, who is, who is Grip Media's most avid reader, my personal most avid reader, even as she tells everyone not to read a word that we write. But she reads every word herself. And she's 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 like, you know, she's single handedly keeping our advertisers in money. So I do appreciate speaking that. Of labor, speaking mm-hmm. of Labour, I listened to um we uh mm-hmm. on Sunday we uh decided to bring the kids to uh Tato Park, Emerald Park, whatever it's called, and we got to the gate of Emerald Park and it was there's a sign that it is closed for maintenance until the end of March. I cannot explain how horrific that is with three kids in the back that you've wound up into a frenzy about the fact that they're going to Tato Park for the last few hours. Anyway, I uh, on the radio on the way down, I happened to listen to um, Ivana Batchik being interviewed um, on that Sunday show and um, about all things Labour and the future of Labour and, you know, whether or not they merge with the sock dams and, 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 and. And it was really quite poor. Um she didn't answer any questions. I thought that there was a lot of kind of waffle. Uh, and um, I, I, I'd be, I've said it before on the podcast about Labour, but like, I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to say that I think that in the future, people will look back and say that getting rid of Alan Caddy as leader was one of the biggest mistakes Labour have made. A and fatal, made, a fatal mistake. Made, They've made plenty of mistakes. Let's be let's be clear. I'm not I'm not I'm not, I'm not a betting man, but if I was a betting man, I would I would I would seriously consider putting money and coming back with zero seats at the next election. Well, I, so there was a poll last Sunday, and then I saw a couple of people doing that poll. The you know um, applying the numbers to a constituency by constituency thing, and and that was the result. It was zero seats for Labour, and I think that um, that getting rid of Alan Kelly was a massive mistake and that they're in for a hiding, which, as I've said before, there's certain Labour TDs like Duncan Smith that I think are really good and I wouldn't like to see them lose their seats, but I think they're in huge trouble. And the interview, you know, it was a kind of a meet the leader kind of general like uh, interview with Ivana and it was it was poor. I was talking to somebody during the week who was at one stage very high up in the TDs and I will say it wasn't Michael McDowell in case he gets the blame somebody who was very high up in the TVs, um, who said to me that looking at the Labour Party at the moment sort of reminds him of the end of the PDs. And he said that w- when he knew it was time to wind the party up, and I still think they shouldn't have wound it up, but he, they did, they wound it up, yeah. um, was when the anger was gone. People had stopped shouting at the PDs. People had stopped saying, I'm never voting PD anymore. You know, the PDs are terrible. Bad. They just didn't care. They would say, oh, you're in the PDs. Oh, that's interesting. They just didn't care anymore. And I think that's where the Labour Party are. People just don't care. There's no, there's no kind of, there's, okay, there's a little bit of residual anger at the Labour Party over the 2011 government. But there's no, there's no, there's no purpose to it. There's no sense that these people are a threat. There's just, there's just, they're, they're those transient kind of those voters who moved to Labour and then got annoyed at Labour when Labour went into government and left Labour, they've moved on to kind of they're two parties ahead of that now. Mm-hmm. You know, what I mean? they've moved on on like so. I I don't think I I think it's right. It's like anything. I mean, there's no if there's no fire. You're probably dead. Mm-hmm. But I do think with the PDs, it's slightly different. The PDs. It was about the personalities. I was talking to somebody about this today and literally this exact subject. And um, I, um, they were saying that, you know, the PDs was, uh, uh, you know, a few big personalities and Labour is a kind of a movement that will always have some kind of, you know, even if Labour come back with no TDs, do you think that the Labour Party is going to shut her up and leave com- and be gone completely? I don't. Um, but I think it's a, it's a real, they're heading for a really, you know, really big existential crop. Very hard to come back from no TDs, first of all. Second of all, like <laughs> this idea that Labour is a movement. Yes, it's the Labour movement and it gets funding and everything from the trade unions. But how many trade union members are voting Labour? A lot of trade union members in the country, if they were all voting Labour, or even the majority of them are voting Labour, you wouldn't be on 3 or 4% of the opinion polls. You'd be on 7 or 8 or 10%. 
Yeah, the, the, the idea that the the, the the labor movement was a working class movement it was a movement of the sort of the working man who was driving a Dublin bus or working on a building site uh, or the working woman who was a nurse in the matter hospital or was yeah. a secretary and so no that's gone it's gone the labor party now is an academic movement uh, of people who work in UCD arts departments and people who are barristers down the forecourts. Uh, not all barristers, by the way, but that, that's that's what the party is. That's what they are. Yeah, so, well, that so, came uh, up in Ivana's interview on Sunday. Yeah, it did. Anyway, um, we better move on. We better talk a little bit about um, events in Ross Cray this week. We talked about immigration a lot on last week's show, and this, this is not the immigration podcast, but it is, according to yet another opinion poll published this week, although this one was taken in the middle of January, but it was published this week in the Sunday Business Post. It is now the number one issue for voters thinking about the European local elections. Um, and there were a couple of things this week that sort of just underlined the, the chaos. I mean, first of all, there was today, today's Thursday, uh, when we're recording this, there's this announcement from the government that they're going to commandeer student accommodation in Cork. Then we had sort of this bizarre proposal in Ross Grey to set up a community hotel in, to sort of buy off the people of Ross Grey. Um, and, and then we have the government continuing to to get itself into a mess all the time by saying things like, oh, we're running criminal checks on people when they come into the country and then answering answering questions via parliamentary questions to people like Carol Nolan and and, um, and others saying, oh, actually, not, that's not true. We're not doing any criminal checks. Like, uh, have they just lost their heads? I think they've lost their heads. I think the government have lost their heads, sir. So, a little bit, back the truck up there a little bit, the hotel in Ross Craig. <laughs> yes, just explain that to me. So, so basically, I mean, first of all, it's uh, what happened in Ross Cray. Obviously, is that the, this hotel? Um, the, the, I think there are two hotels. Yeah, as best I can tell, there are two hotels. And hotel A, hotel A was open. Hotel B was closed. So, um, the hotel A that was open, which is called Racket Hall, was suddenly purchased, or either the people who owned it signed a contract with the Department of Children to accommodate migrants. And all of a sudden, all the events that were going to be in that hotel, people's communions, um, people's birthday parties and so on, were cancelled because it was now being turned into a migrant accommodation centre. And a big part of the issue for people in Ross Cray, not the whole issue, but a big part of the issue for people in Ross Cray was that the town was being left with no hotel. Um, that, it, it, you know, the, the hotel and the service it provided were being taken away overnight. People were being put to an inconvenience. Um, and then, obviously, there were all the other ancillary issues about the supply of school places, doctors, and, and, and worries about the general worries that get associated that we're all familiar with this stage with this issue. So that's Hotel A. So part of the proposal, then Jackie Cahill, who's the Fianna Fáil TD for my neck of the woods here in Tipperary North, or what will be Tipperary North the next election, and is currently just Tipperary, um, he announced that he had brokered an agreement with the government in principle that they would buy Hotel B, this mm-hmm. other hotel which had been closed, and that they would reopen it as a community hotel run as a community amenity for the people, so that all the communions and what have you could be moved in there. And this was the this was the this was part of the sort of offers the people of Ruskray that the, you know the government would improve their town. And it just strikes me this is mad. So well, this is not a community hotel. Like, it's, what? Like, so many questions. Like, for the events, that sounds just like a town hall is needed. You know what I mean? Like, what's the community hotel going to do? Well, it sounds to me like they, they intend to have a hotel basically run by the government, specifically for the people of Ross Cray. But how does the government get into running a hotel? I mean, there's no economies of scale. It's not as if you're you're reopening the Great Southern Hotel chain and running 50 hotels. And that didn't even work when they were doing it, which is why the Great Southern Hotel chain no longer exists. But it, what does that mean when you say community hotel? I mean, if it's being run for the community, does the community get favourable pricing? I mean, who works there? Uh, who runs it? What government department runs it? Is there some civil servant in Dublin who's going to be seconded down to be a hotel manager? Or the it, 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 comes it, in at night time, turns down your bed and puts a chocolate on your pillow. Yeah, it, it's not that... And I want to be clear here to people listening. It's not that I'm against Russ Gray having a hotel or, or, or even that possibly if it was well thought out over a couple of months, this proposal couldn't work. But it just seems to me like it's evidence of the mad panic because, first of all, 
every other town in the country that's in this position is now going to want their own community hotel. <laughs> I, mean, I come from a little town called Bally Bay in County Monaghan, and there's a hotel there called the Riverdale, which has been sort of closed for oh, most, most of my adult life. It's been closed for more than it's been open. At various points, the new new owners have come in and tried to open it as a commercial concern, but it, it just doesn't work. The, the town isn't big enough to justify the size of the building. And so it, it's most of my life it's been lying derelict. Um, I, I, and I, I guarantee you there will be somebody who says if they try and put asylum seekers into Bally Bay, um, we're going to open this hotel. We want this hotel open, this community hotel. And they'll be within their rights to ask because Ross Gray is the president. So every town in the country will want one. And every politician, every every government TD will be asked why they can't have one. So politically, it's sort of mad, unless the government wants to get into opening hotels across the country and running those as well. Um, and secondly, it, it doesn't seem to me to be even coming close to addressing the real concerns people have here, which is not that their town doesn't have community hotels, though they'd be nice to have, I'm sure, but that um, that all of this is just so haphazard and unfair to people and not planned in any way, shape, or form, and also uh, putting huge burdens on towns. I mean, I was talking to Michael McNamara today, who referred me back to the case of uh, uh, case of Inch in County Clare, um, and I just asked him. I asked him to remind me um, what was the situation there, and he said that townland was being tripled in population. So, so people were understandably a little bit upset that their townland was being tripled in population. And that's an understandable concern. And the government can't do anything to address that. So it's just muddling on um, and, and coming up with these haphazard schemes like community hotels. And I, I really, it, it feels to me like they've lost the head, Sarah. But you know? it, last week we had this conversation and I was saying about, you know, the issue with immigration and, and, and how it's, communication is a huge part of it and you made the point and it's you know it's also true that it's not communication that it's policy and that's uh, but I think that the you know both of those things can be true at the same time but I also think that this is another example of that this kind of nonsense getting onto the airwaves and the, these kind of ideas getting out there is a is a symptom is a, a glaring symptom of the breakdown in communication that when there's gaps in this story and 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 you know, a lack of clear messaging and, and nobody with their arms around this problem from a communication point of view, that's where stuff like this comes into the comes into play. Mm. Yeah, well, look, it's going to roll and roll and roll and roll. And I'm sure we'll have much more to talk about in terms of immigration. But I want to talk about something that won't happen next week, uh, which did happen this week, which was um, coming back. And it's also on sort of the terms of communication. And Sarah, you know that if I love talking about anything on this podcast or indeed off this podcast, I love talking about throuples. Love it. Um, Dude, brought- I've, known you, I've known you now for how many, is it 15, 20 years, John? And it's something you bring up regularly. It is. It is. Well, I'm fascinated with these alternative relationships that people have. I just don't understand how anybody has the time or the energy. But anyway, uh, Michael McDowell last week wrote an op-ed saying that he was going to, he, he thought that it was the safest option was to vote no in the two referendums on March the 8th, one on, one on women in the home and the other on the redefinition of family in the Constitution. And this relates to the redefinition of family in the Constitution, because at the moment the Constitution of Ireland refers to the family based on marriage. Yeah. And if it is amended per the government's proposed amendment, it will then read the family based on marriage or other durable relationships. And so Michael McDowell, quite reasonably, I think, asked in his, his op-ed who defines other durable relationships. As he said, it will only be defined because the government doesn't define what a durable relationship is. It doesn't say in the referendum what a durable relationship is. It will be for the courts to define in case law. And Michael McDowell, copying me, because I'd spotted this question, I'm, I'm joking, Michael McDowell didn't copy me because I'm sure he doesn't read me. But I had also raised this question before that, so I was gratified that Michael did the same thing. He, he said, it is eminently possible that somebody could you know, to get, he gave two examples. First of all, somebody who comes from a country that has polygamous marriage and arrives here as a, as a migrant or an immigrant, legally or illegally, who then wants to bring home ho- over their two wives and says, well, you don't recognize polygamous marriage, but for me, this is my family and this is a durable relationship and it should be recognized. Would the courts have the authority to say no? And secondly, take the example of an Irish group of people who form a polyamorous relationship of two or three people uh, two or three or more people in a in a in a sort of sexual romantic mutual relationship 
who declare themselves a family and say their relationship is durable, would they then essentially be granted the same rights as a married couple because they would form a family based on a durable relationship? And so this is a this is a question. Michael McDowell, who is a former Attorney General and former Minister for Justice, a very senior barrister, raised as a legal issue. So then Roderick O'Gorman is forced to stand up in the doll this week and say, no, 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 no. Uh, that's not what it means at all. In fact, we don't want to legalize troubles. Which I thought was very amusing and also deeply unsatisfactory as an explanation. Um, so he can't. Like, he, he, he can't say that. Well, you're a lawyer, you know. He can't say that. He can't say. So, I'll give an example, right? Um, people listening might remember um, Dil Vikramasinghe. Um, Dil used to work for News Talk. Dil is um, uh, married to a, a woman in a lesbian relationship. And they have two children. And about a year ago, Dill made this announcement and it featured was the, there was stories run about it in The Independent and other places about how she was uh, now in a polyamorous relationship. And um, um, basically, so now I'm just checking on Twitter here, but I'm pretty sure she tweeted a while ago that um, herself and her wife now have new partners. And so I'm positive that that she would say that those relationships are durable do, do you know what I mean so like I, 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 I know Dill and I used to be uh, she used to be on a radio show years ago and I think she's an absolutely lovely person so I, I, I don't I'm asking this only for clarity not in any mocking way but she's still with um, her wife Anne Marie isn't she it's just that yeah. they have other people in the relationship okay they live together they live as a family with their two children but they both have new partners and um, and so that is a my my point is I I'm just I'm just checking here because I can't find the tweet but she she wrote recently in December she wrote I celebrate my first year of being polyamorous and consensual non monogamy this unexpected development has brought me on an incredible journey of self discovery and unprecedented self growth so hashtag being polyamory polyam rocks so that I'm sure to deal those relationships are durable right yes. so it's up to the- so in, in a legal setting, it's not up for Roderick O'Gorman to say, "Oh no, we've decided polyamorous isn't covered." It's up for Dill to it's up for Dill to make the argument that her relationship is durable, and it's not for him to say whether it is or it isn't. That's what case law is for. Exactly. So, so the basic point here is that if you put the phrase "other durable relationships" into the Constitution, the only people who get to decide what that means are the now you're going to correct me if I'm wrong. Seven, I think, members of the Irish Supreme Court. Yeah. Nine in the US, seven in Ireland. Um, and here's the thing. We already have one very senior, eminent lawyer in Michael McDowell who disagrees with Roderick O'Gorman's interpretation. There's every chance that at some stage there will be four eminent lawyers on the Supreme Court. There's only four, only the whole seven, who will, who will also disagree with Roderick O'Gorman and find compelling, as I find compelling, the argument that if, an other, if a durable relationship makes your family, then three people in a polyamorous relationship are a family, if they've been together. I mean, if I was on the court and somebody came to me, uh, uh, you have to interpret the Constitution based on what the words say. That's something I fundamentally believe in, because you, you can't just insert your own opinions if you're a judge. Yes. And they say, they say well, we've been in this relationship for seven years, the three of us. Uh, we live as a family. We support each other financially. We are discriminated against. So the Constitution says that the family is based on other durable relationships as well as marriage. We should have the same rights as married people. I, I don't see how a judge reasonably turns that down. And that's what I'm What does durable mean exactly? Um, like so, without definitions, this is the problem. You know, it's like the other. It's like the other referendum. It's it's, it's without a definition. It's like hate speech, the hate speech bill, without a definition of what hate means, without a definition of what durable means. You're just swinging in the wind, waiting for somebody to come in and make their case. So for but for Roderick O'Gorman to stand up and say it won't apply to polyamorous relationships, A, is a nonsense, and B, is a, is troubling because either he's standing up and thinks that this what he's saying is actually true, or he's standing up and knows it's not true and doesn't care. Yeah, I think it's going to become a big issue in the referendum campaign. I mean, I, here's the thing. We could be totally wrong, and there could be a majority of people in the country who kind of go, mm, 
I, I don't care if people in throuples or polyamorous relationships have the same rights as married people. And you know what? Maybe, maybe, maybe that is what people think. But I think the question will be more, do government even know what they're asking us to vote on? Have they thought through the implications of it? Have they actually thought about what we could be legalizing here? Because it's not just that. I'll give you another example, um, Sarah, which I think would be more relevant to people, um, which is if, imagine um, a situation in rural Ireland where there is an elderly farmer and a young neighboring man who is helping him out for 20 years because he doesn't have any family and he's helping him with the cows and he's helping him with the work on the farm and then that man dies mm-hmm. um, and leaves the farm to a, a distant cousin living in America. Yeah. Does that does that young man not have a case to go into the Supreme Court and say, I was this man's helper for 20 years. I, I looked after him during the day. I helped him work. I was with him in the evening. I got him his shopping on Saturday. For all intents and purposes, we had a durable relationship where I was basically like his surrogate son, and I therefore should have the same inheritance rights as if I was his son. And is, does he not have at least an arguable case in a court to say, actually, you know, I, I think, I think we became family because our relationship was lengthy and it was durable. Um, I think. Well, I, suppose I, never, I never even, to be honest, until you started that, I never even considered the expansion of the durable relationships outside of non-romantic ones. But wh- most 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 family relationships aren't romantic, Sarah. Uh, obviously, the, the core relationship, part of every family is romantic. But... I'm just thinking, I, I've only really just been, yeah, like, I've only really been thinking about the core one for, for now. Yeah. yeah I, 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 think, I think there's huge scope for this to be I, I think there will be a you know, the, if this is put into the constitution. I think we're going to have fifty years of test cases of people people trying to expand it, uh, expand the definition. Because I think in that case, I think uh, it, certainly coming from rural Ireland myself, if, if a situation like that were to arise where somebody was helping an elderly farmer for twenty years and then the farmer left everything to some distant cousin in America or Australia, I think there'd be lots of local sympathy for that young man. And I think a lot of people will come forward to say, yeah, he was like family really, and he should have inheritance rights. So I think there's. Also, tax implications. Then, so does he? But 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 uh, so, you know, if you're if you're the child, um, you know, adopted or or biological child of the farmer, um, you obviously have inheritance rights in terms of like you have a tax free amount that you can inherit as a child, and then you know the remainder or whatever. If you're the spouse, you can inherit, uh, like so, you can inherit all of it tax free. If you're the so so. The question starts to arise then that like which type of durable relationship, which your durable relationship, what 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 exa- what type of other relationship are you hoping that it will mirror the parent child one, the uh, the marriage one, because some, some have better, you know, tax implications for from an inheritance point of view than others. Like there's all kinds of things. It's yeah. all kinds of, of knock on effects. And this comes back to the point that I've been saying before about these types of referendums, which grinds my gears a lot. And it's the same, you know, with things like the hate speech bill, uh, uh, the same kind of the same laissez faire, reckless kind of attitude to these kind of things, which is the Constitution is not a document that you hack away at because of whatever, you know, whatever's trendy in Teen Vogue this month or whatever. It's a serious, it's a serious document. It's a serious, it, it, it's a very serious thing to ask people to vote to change it. And, you know, I saw the, the you know, all this narrative around Oh, you know, we're hoping that a yes vote by the National Women's Council will start a conversation. You don't start a conversation by changing the constitution. You have a conversation. You have a debate. And if you win, you change the the constitution after. And it's it's a real, tr- really troubling to me, this kind of attitude of like, let's have another referendum and another and another and another and hack away at it to show how woke and, and, and morally progressive we all are. No, it's yeah. a serious document. I, I think this durable relationship thing is a, is a time bomb being inserted into the Constitution. Not one that's going to cause the collapse of civilization or anything like that, but one that is going to just uncork a whole shit ton of angst and stress uh, and, and potential legislative problems around the world. The road. Because I actually think the inheritance thing is going to be the biggest issue. It's, it's going to impact immigration. It's potentially got to impact on sort of family structure in terms of polygamy and bigamy and all those things. Um, consensual also, by the way there's also people for example that I know and this is actually a really common 
thing across Ireland, if you think about it, which is that so Mary and Paddy are married and um, they have four children and Mary and Paddy are very wealthy. Mary dies and Paddy is, you know, lives for another 30 years. Now Paddy's old and Paddy has had a durable relationship and friendship with Angela. And the kids are really desperate that Angela and Paddy don't get married because they know that if they get married, that has financial implications for the kids in terms of the estate. What about Angela now starts saying she has a durable relationship with Paddy? Where does that leave the kids? Exactly. Exactly. Uh, it, 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 uh, these are all issues that nobody is thinking about and nobody is talking about. Um, and you know, if the referendum is passed, I think we'll probably start thinking and talking about them afterwards because that's what we do as a country. But that's um, not the way it should work. No, well, that goes without saying, Sarah. Goes without, I mean, this referendum, I think, I, I, and obviously as a journalist, I cannot tell people how to vote, and I will not tell people how to vote, but I can tell them that I personally am voting no um, to to that one and to the other one, uh, both. I think they're poorly thought out, but people have to listen to the debate and make up their minds themselves. But I think I think Roderick O'Gorman standing up in the door and going, oh, no, I don't intend to legalize throuples. And then to think that that... that um, he, by the way, he also said some other things. He said some bizarre things. Uh, he said that he wasn't going to legalize troubles because um, there was no, they, they were not a fundamental unit of society. Well, well, first of all, we're not being asked to vote on what a fundamental unit of society is. We're being asked to vote on what a family is. Yeah. It's not, not taken as given that a family is a fundamental unit of society, even though it is, but it's not taken as given in any Irish law. Yeah. Uh, and then he said that they had, uh, they had no moral weight. It's a fascinating thing for a progressive like Robert O'Gorman to say that we're now judging relationships and whether they have moral weight or not. Um, I, I would actually argue with somebody who thinks troubles are probably a bad situation to end up in, that any that that, that may well have moral weight. It doesn't mean we should legalize them. But he, he just seemed, he, he, was like, he was like a deer caught in the headlights. And then he kind of make a joke of it by saying throuple a lot, which is admittedly a funny word. So that did work for him a little bit. But um, it, it just... I also think it's kind of funny and I think that like, the, you know, Roger O'Gorman, who uh, I don't think I'm, I don't think I'm overstepping here by saying that I think he's, you know, it would be, you know, pr- considered to be pretty progressive and pretty woke is like five minutes into a speech and alre- already like accidentally or on purpose making moral judgments about other people's relationships, which is the kind of thing that they would suggest that they would never, ever do. It's fascinating. Anyway, um, I suppose, actually, before we go, I should ask you about the other political news of the week, because people think it's strange if you don't mention it, and, and uh, yeah, I'm blindsiding you here, because Sarah and I do kind of discuss our topics before we start, so, so I am blindsiding her a little bit, but we should probably say something. Should we say anything about Jack Chambers' brave decision to come out as a, a gay man? I, I, I have to say, before you say anything, A, fair play to him, best luck for, luck for him, nobody cares. I think it's fascinating that Dublin West now has 75% of its TDs as gay men, and that's an interesting demographic shift and, and, and reflects kind of the scale of the demographic shift in Ireland and the shift in attitudes over the last couple of years. But um, do we care? Should politicians be making that kind of announcement in general or just, just does nobody care? Um, I think, I think, I'm not, like, I'm not gay, so I don't, you know, I think that people, you know, if, if it's something that you've not said publicly and you feel like you've kept a secret, I think yeah, far be it from me to to suggest that you should or shouldn't, you know, relieve yourself of a burden if that's the way it's felt for you. I don't know. Um, I think I was I was impressed and 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 pleased at the positive reception that he got. Um, you know, like people were very supportive of it, and I think that. I think that nobody cares, but in the nicest, you know, because when you say nobody cares, it kind of sounds a bit harsh. I don't mean it that way. I think it's nice that nobody cares. It's not important to anybody, but it was, it seemed like it was important to him and, and good for him. But I think, yeah, I mean, like I, I think we nearly live in a society. We're just about there where it really doesn't matter. And genuinely no one cares. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I, I, and I think that's true of all things. Josefa Madigan, the minister for whatever she's the minister for now, I don't know if she's the minister for anymore, but uh, she announced before Christmas that she was being divorced from her husband. And I didn't even notice until yesterday. Somebody mentioned to me, and I, I genuinely didn't know. So I, 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 I do think we're a very tolerant society in that way. No one cares. I mean, I, I don't care that. Well, this way, 
I'm, I'm, I'm pissed off at Jack Chambers because of his ridiculous proposed changes to the rules of the road. I don't <laughs> think he should be re-elected on the basis of that. But good luck to him. Uh, I hope he finds happiness. Um, yeah. All right. We shall uh, leave it there, I think, for this week. Um, unless there's anything, Sarah, that we missed and that you want to add, leave the readers with a final thought. L- readers, no. listeners. Listeners, no, nothing. I think we're, I think we're, I think that's a full lid for this week, John. That's a full lid. So thank you everyone for listening as ever. Uh, thanks for all the comments last week. We didn't get to them this week and that's not because they were mean. Um, we just didn't get to them, but we'll, we'll do a roundup next week. Um, if you have anything to us to say to us, leave leave a comment on YouTube or indeed email me or tweet abuse to Sarah or whatever it is you want to do. Uh, and let us know what you thought. But until next week from Sarah and from I, that was the week that really was.